30. So I want to welcome everyone to the Center for Marxist Education. I'm Doug Green, volunteer here, and I give the monthly lecture series we'll do in Machiavelli. But I just want to get some of the house cleaning stuff out of the way first. So we have a few upcoming events here on Wednesday, which would be the 8th. There's something on Imperialism in Columbia, I believe it's 7 o'clock. And there's a movie showing next Sunday. I forget offhand which movie it is, but I can bring it up after the talk. In my upcoming talks, um, next month, uh, there's a long time coming, but Charles Bettelheim will be July. Uh, so that would be the first, keep in mind this is the first Saturday in July, unless it's the fourth. Um, then it's, what is it, August would be Antonio Labriola, that's pretty obscure. Uh, September, which ironically is already published, that would be uh, Leninism and Blancism. There was this talk I gave over in London. Be free to go online and find that if you want to spoil it. I mean, what I give here will not be considerably different than that piece. October, I have no clue yet. Um, let's see, anything else? Uh, for this talk, uh, unfortunately, it's a little wordy. And uh, I purposely was sticking to theorists, Marxist theorists also, who were explicitly drawing on Machiavelli. So I don't really talk about, say, someone like Lenin or Mao, who I would argue do draw, a, you know, who could be argued as Machiavellian figures. And hopefully as I come through this, you, you will see that Machiavellian I don't mean in a negative context. But we can get started, because I'd like to open it up for discussion afterwards. So. Machiavelli and the Primacy of Politics. So, if we were to look at most people who have existed throughout history, we can say that they lived in obscurity, dire poverty, possessing no titles or pretensions to greatness. They lived and died in toil. The vast majority of humanity has passed through these conditions. Yet, what did these people think about their circumstances and what to do about them? While there has always been resistance and struggle to oppression, most people have understood their conditions to be divinely ordained, the natural order of things that human nature is unchangeable, or that this is the best of all possible worlds. In other words, there was often little concrete thinking about how to change their fate. In fact, we can safely say that the whole structure and ideology of class society from the Pax Romana to the Pax Americana is designed to exclude the consideration of any alternative. The revolutionary left, more often than not, rather than challenging these modes of thinking, has tended to reinforce them. Trends such as economism, a naive belief in scientific laws of history, reformism, faith in the development of the productive forces, or evolutionary social change have tended to encourage passivity and ultimately acceptance of the established order. These tendencies are not confined to any single group on the far left, but can be found amongst all of them. These modes of thought encourage mechanical determinism, which foreclose action and steers thinking about politics and strategy. In our time, the predominant view on the left is not one of determinism, though, or fatalism, but cynicism. According to Slavoj Žižek, we all know the innocent child from Anderson's The Emperor's New Clothes, who publicly proclaims the fact that the emperor is naked today in our cynical era. Such a strategy no longer works. It has lost its disturbing power, since everyone now proclaims that the emperor is naked. And yet nothing happens. Nobody seems to mind. The system just goes on functioning as if the emperor were fully dressed. Even though we all know the emperor has no clothes, we still go through the motions and rituals of pretending that we believe, which helps to perpetuate the social order and the reigning ideology. Despite the openly voiced cynicism when we utter the system is corrupt and irreformable, Zizek says we only imagine that we do not really believe in our ideology. In spite of this imaginary distance, we continue to practice it. This cynicism is not emancipatory, and the message it conveys is a reigned conviction, a resigned conviction, that the world we live in, even if it's not the best of all possible worlds, is the least bad, such that any radical change will only make things worse. And in contrast to our cynical society with this lack of belief, those who do take our, their belief seriously, whether terrorists, in scare quotes, or communists are dismissed as barbarians and a threat to culture. They dare to take their beliefs seriously. And if we do take our belief in an emancipated society seriously, that it's imperative upon us to not succumb to any of the pitfalls that our society is the natural order, pacifism, or cynicism, or cynicism, what requires is we do something else. What I propose here, basing myself largely upon Machiavelli, is another approach for Marxists that of the primacy of politics. There's only through revolutionary praxis, 
building alliance with the oppressed and the exploited, creating independent political organizations, and the development of strategy that we can win. This has been truth of the great Marxist revolutionaries throughout history, whether Lenin, Gramsci, or Mao. In other words, our approach, following that of Machiavelli, is to grasp the primacy of politics by understanding our moment with its relational forces, how to apply our strengths, and to act to create a new order which endures. Now, Machiavelli was a, uh, born in the 15th century, a, Florent, a Florentine diplomat and the author of The Prince, The Discourses, and was emblematic of many of the trends of the Italian Renaissance. The Renaissance displaced God as the center of the universe, and following the rediscovery of Greek philosophy, saw man as the measure of all things. The Renaissance, of course, brought with it flowering and revolutionizing the previous conceptions of art, literature, architecture, and in Machiavelli's case, politics. This shift in values had profound implications for how Machiavelli would conceive of politics. Whereas previous thinkers subordinated politics to religion, Machiavelli would place religion in the service of politics. By detaching politics from religion and looking at it as an autonomous discipline with its own methods and laws, Machiavelli can be said to be the founder of modern political science. Although the Renaissance flourished in Italy, the peninsula itself was politically divided. Italy was composed of multiple city-states which fought each other in wars and was ravaged by neighboring great powers. There were attempts by local rulers such as Caesar Bor Borgia <laughs> sorry, and his father, Pope Alexander VI, to bring central Italy under their rule. Despite the brutality of the Borgia state building methods, Machiavelli took inspiration from them, declaring, I shall never hesitate to cite them and, his, and their actions. In fact, one of the main, although not the only main, inspirations behind the prince was to offer instruction for a future ruler who would take up his exhortation to liberate Italy from the barbarians. Before going further, it's necessary to stress that Machiavelli's conception of history, now on the surface it appears that Machiavelli argues that nothing ever changes in the world, and he believes in fatalism and a cyclical view of history. And he says in the preface to book two of the Discourses, and I quote, reflection now upon the course of human affairs, I think, as a whole, the world remains very much in the same condition, and the good in it always balances the evil. But the good and evil change from one country to another. As we learn from the history of those ancient kingdoms that differed from each other in manners, whilst the world at large remained the same. However, Machiavelli contradicts the statement by saying in chapter 6 of the Discourse of that, and another quote, but as all human things are kept in a, perpetu in a perpetual movement and can never remain stable, states naturally either rise or decline, and necessity compels them to many acts to which reason will not influence them. So that having organized a republic competent to maintain herself with expan without expanding, still if forced by necessity to extend her territory, in such case we shall see her foundations give way and herself quickly brought to ruin. What Machiavelli is doing here is stating that there is a historical law of change. History is not standing still, but it is going through unceasing changes, people, circumstances, etc., rise and fall. In fact, it isn't just that things are forever changing, but that many of these changes are unpredictable. According to Louis Althusser, Machiavelli traces the development of human society to chance and rejects any social con contract view of politics. Althusser says, to say that chance is at the origin of societies and governments, and to say that the onset, at, at the onset human beings were scattered, dispersion is inherent in chance, and, is ob and this is obviously to reject any anthropological ontology of society and politics. Machiavelli notes that as society develops, there are various forms of government which can exist, republic, monarchy, aristocracy. However, he notes that all kinds of government are defective, those three which we have qualified as good because they are short-lived, and the three bad ones because of their inherent viciousness. Machiavelli notes that good governments are that way because they are short-lived, otherwise if they last longer, they will go through the process of degeneration. And this is where Machiavelli recasts the debate on the state. He's not so much concerned whether it is good or bad, but with its duration. And according to Althusser, Machiavelli is interested in only one form of government, that which enables a state to endure. When Machiavelli looks at the cycle of history with its immutable human nature and continual movement of growth and decay, he's interested in putting a stop to this cycle by studying states at last, such as ancient Rome, as Althusser puts it, Machiavelli wants to escape it, the will to be emancipated from the immutable necessity of the endless cycle of the same revolutions, in order to create not a government that is going to degenerate to pave the way for its successor, but a state that lasts. So what does it mean to break with the cycle of history and to undertake something new? 
And a major, if not the major, theme of Machiavelli's Prince is that of the new prince founding and ruling a new order. This new prince must not deal with people and the conjuncture as he would like or imagine them to be, but as they really are. Machiavelli uses examples from ancient and medieval history to illustrate how princes ought to live and rule and live. A prince is guided by expediency to use all means to achieve their ends. Seemingly men commentators such as the Catholic Church have concluded that Machiavelli was just, justifying immorality in place of ethics and politics. Let the irony of that sink in. As Machiavelli is being realistic, since a new order has many st uh, stalwart defenders of the old way and only lukewarm friends among its partisans. At the heart of Machiavelli's prince, according to Althusser, is that he was the founder of modern political science, who was able to conceive how human action and ability or virtu can intervene in a conjuncture to found a new order. Machiavelli is no longer concerned with the various forms of government, but of virtu and its opposite. And virtu is quintessentially the quality specific to the subjective conditions for the constitution of a state that endures. A prince filled with virtu would thus be able to act politically and can master fortune to his advantage in a given situation to pursue the goal of, a goal of founding and consolidating a state. The prince who does so is walking on an unknown road where there's no guarantee of success, but is able to act independently, rally his forces, and forge his own path. Yet if the prince remains beholden to others without his own initiative, Machiavelli says that there's a danger of he who has not first laid his foundations may be able with great ability to lay them afterwards, but they will be laid with trouble to the architect and danger to the builder. Althusser says that Machiavelli is the first theorist consciously and systematically to subordinate technical questions regarding armies, armies and wars to the premacy of politics. By premacy of politics, Machiavelli means that arms, ideology, and religion must subor be subordinated to the political goal to be, to be accomplished. For if a prince has virtue and acts politically, this means that he can influence how events turn out. Unlike the heavens, the events of the human world are subject to change and manipulation. We are not merely objects of fate, but we can understand our situations, the fluctuations of fortune, in order to prepare an effective intervention. <clears throat> Therefore, Machiavelli demystifies and secularizes political and social phenomena by sh showing not only that we can understand them, but how to influence events in our favor. Althusser says that Machiavelli is the first theorist of the conjuncture, whereby he's able to take account of all the determinations, all the existing concrete circumstances making an inventory, a detailed breakdown, comparison, <coughs> etc. In Machiavelli's case, this means understanding the ruin and disunity of Italy, its subjugation, etc., classes at play. Yet Machiavelli is not proposing a neutral social or political analysis of a conjuncture, but grasping their contradictory system, which poses the political problem and indicates its historical solution, rendering it a political objective, a practical task. With a practical objective in mind, the elements of the conjuncture become relations of force. They are assessed as relations of force, as a function of their engagement, with a view to the political objective to be attained. The relations of force are allies, enemies, neutrals, who need to be won over, defeated, or otherwise by a new prince, who is able to mobilize for the task at hand. As another Machiavellian figure of modern times put it, who are our friends and who are our enemies, this question is one of primary importance. Spoiler, that's Mao. As we've already mentioned, one of the major concerns of the prince is the question of founding a new order. The question of foundation means that Machiavelli wants to halt the process of continuous cycles of growth and decay in human affairs by a fresh start. Machiavelli's realism meant that he was under no illusions that creating a new order in, uh, entailed violence, otherwise uh, chaos would reign. As he warned, there is nothing more difficult to take in hand, more perilous to conduct, more uncertain in its success than to take the lead in the introduction of a new order of things. Machiavelli warned that a new state would succumb to disorder and res resistance unless the new sovereign power undertook swift and violent measures to wipe out the old regime. As Louis Auguste Blanqui succinctly described the function of a revolutionary dictatorship, the state is the gendarmerie of the rich against the poor. We must produce another state, which is the gendarmerie of the poor against the rich. The art of statecraft was different when founding an order compared to ruling an established regime with fixed laws and orderly procedures. In such a settled era, humanity and patience is called for and is the norm. Yet in times of war, collapse, and revolution, when the old laws are ignored and ca uh, cataclysm reigns, no one is safe. In this state of exception, there is no law and order save for those with the power and will to create their own. 
as, and Machiavelli recognized that it was not through orderly plebiscites, the ballot box, or divine will that states are created, but via extraordinary and primal violence at their foundation. Foundational violence has played a preeminent role in the creation of new states from the empire of Alexander the Great, the first French Republic, the Soviet Union, and the United States. And every state before its creation employed illegitimate violence, which was subsequently turned into legitimate violence, both through coercion and constitutions. We're faced with the myth that states are established peacefully or through social contract while foundational violence is ignored or transformed into a mythic and symbolic narrative to justify the new order. Machiavelli, in placing politics first, understood that sovereign power was not established by the grace of God. Rather, religion was at the service of politics as an instrument alongside the army for the foundation <coughs> and constitution and duration of the state. However, religion was not a reliable means of control since the nature of the people is variable, willis it is easy to persuade them, it is difficult to fix them in that persuasion. And should the people lose their obedience to the sovereign, then it may be possible to make them believe by force. While ordinary people may hate their rulers and remain resigned to their lot in life for the simple reason that the state holds the sword and shows no hesitation in wielding it. Machiavelli know, knew that, this, that state power came primarily through force of arms, and if a prince was to succeed in intervening in a conjuncture to create a new order, then he could not prevail with ideas or moral force alone. And as Machiavelli says, hence it is that all armed prophets have conquered and the unarmed ones have been destroyed. At the moment of radical rupture, there is no alternative to violence and force. This situation requires a singular will that cannot concern itself with morality, but had to act swiftly and ruthlessly. Otherwise, the prince will find himself facing resistance from holdovers of the new order who desire his overthrow. They need to be annihilated. With stark and brutal honesty, Machiavelli states, in seizing a state, the usurper ought to examine closely into all those injuries which it is necessary for him to inflict, and to do them all at one stroke so as not to have them to repeat them daily. And thus, by not unsettling men, he will be able to reassure them and win them to himself by benefits. He who does otherwise, either from timidity or evil advice, is always compelled to keep the knife in his hand. Neither can he rely on his subjects, nor can he attach them, nor can they attach themselves to him, owing to their continued and repeated wrongs. For injuries ought to be done all at once, all at one time, so that being tasted less, the offense less. Benefits ought to be given little by little, so that the flavor of them may last longer." End quote. Although Machiavelli posits force as the ultimate guarantee of power, he does not argue that force is the sole foundation of power. And if a prince relies just on brute force, he risks becoming a tyrant. In answering the question of whether it is better to be loved than feared, or feared than loved, it may be answered that one should wish to be both. But because it is difficult to unite them in one person, it is much safer to be feared than loved when of the two either must be dispensed with. Yet Machiavelli goes on and states that a prince should be feared while avoiding being hated. This means that while relying on force, the prince should not act arbitrarily, but he must do it on proper justification and for manifest cause. But above all things, he must keep his hands off the property of others, because men are quicker to forget the death of their father than the loss of their patrimony. Althusser says that Machiavelli was stating that the prince must at all costs avoid being hated by his people obviously signifies that he must be aware of alienating the people as the greatest peril. When a prince comes to power, he must deal with both the nobility and the people, for the nobility wish to rule and oppress the people. And it is impossible to satisfy both the nobility and the people, so the prince should side with the people, since he can never secure himself against a hostile people because of there being too many, whilst from the nobles he can secure himself as their few in number. Therefore, it is necessary for the prince to be the champion of the people and to represent their interests, or at least appear to, and wipe out the old nobility. Once this is done, the prince can create a new nobility or ruling class who owe their power and authority to him. While the prince should appear to be on the side of the people, this does not mean he actually does so, since his interests are those of the ruler and not of the people. The prince needs to be adept at wearing the different masks of merciful, faithful, humane, upright, religious. Legitimacy is manifested in many ways and means, so the prince must master them all. And this is a really wonderful quote. Everyone sees what you appear to be. Few really what you really know what you are. And those few dare not oppose themselves to the opinion of the many who have the majesty of the state to defend them. And in the actions of all men, especially princes, which is not prudent to challenge, one judges by the result. A prince must be cunning, patient, 
ruthless, beloved, and righteous, all these traits are the different faces of state power. All of them are means the end of power, and the prince must match them all. Another way Machiavelli puts it is that a prince must possess the two natures of, like a centaur. You must know the two ways of contesting, the one of law, the other of force. The first method is proper to men, the second to beasts. Because the first is, is frequently not sufficient, it is necessary to have recourse to the second. Therefore, it is necessary for a prince to understand how to avail himself of the beast and the man. The ruler who is able to wear the different masks of power, mass them all, will be able to rule. However, not all princes can possess all the good qualities that Machiavelli lists. So if they're lacking in virtues, they must appear to have them. A prince needs to be crafty and hide his weakness so that he can be ready to turn itself accordingly as the winds and variations of force, fortune force it. The prince who appears to wear all the masks of power will be able to rule in different ways with law and force as the situation requires. Machiavelli does not judge these actions to be immoral since one judges by the result. Machiavelli strips power of its halo and sanctity to reveal how it actually works. For revolutionaries, it is a profound lesson that goes contrary to much of our contemporary political wisdom, which distrusts political power or best hopes for some form of horizontal democracy. Rather, socialism requires the seizure of political power by the working class. Otherwise, socialism will remain an ideal dream that can only inst be instituted by fantastic uh, means. As Lenin declared, the key question of every revolution is undoubtedly the question of state power. And Machiavelli understood, as many other revolutionaries have, that founding a new order is not painless, it comes through primal violence. To try and find another way to power that ignores those difficulties and struggles is to surrender in advance. For the proletariat struggle is illegitimate and illegal since the law is made, as Blanqui said, to protect the freedom to enslave and the freedom to exploit. Therefore, the revolution will be illegal since the law is made to defend oppression and crime. The legitimacy for proletariat revolutions comes not via elections or an orderly transition, which of course is illusionary, but by a, a, a radical rupture with the old regime, possessing the legitimacy of its own just cause and supported by the people of arms, create its own state and transform strength into right and obedience into duty. The class struggle is a struggle for power, and one side or the other is destined to rule. The Turkish revolutionary communist Ibrahim Kakaya laid out the stakes of the struggle as follows. This is a power struggle between the proletariat and the bourgeoisie. Those who recognize this right for the bourgeoisie and yet deny it to the proletariat are enemies of the people, whether openly or secretly. Now, the Italian communist Antonio Gramsci, believe it or not, was a communist and not a literary critic, reflected on the defeats of the revolutionary movement of his time and the triumph of fascism, turned to Machiavelli while languishing in Mussolini's jails. Gramsci saw Machiavelli's project as similar to that of Mar Marx and Lenin, to theorize a practice to educate those who are ignorant people, the revolutionary class of his time. Gramsci argued that Machiavelli's prince was not just addressed to rulers, but his work was intended for those who were not in the know, and that is those whom he intended uh, to educate politically. Machiavelli, according to Gramsci, was not an advocate of, for political amorality, but addressing the need for the prince to educate the people on the need for a new society. Machiavelli's work was valuable since he understood that po politics was an autonomous science, which could help revitalize Marxism or the philosophy of praxis. For Gramsci, Machiavelli's concern with the primacy of politics was a welcome antidote to passive, reformist, and economistic debasements of Marxism. Politics, as Gramsci understood it, was a practice of concretely analyzing a unique situation, which Lenin called the living soul of Marxism. Undertaking a concrete analysis meant conceiving different relations of force between parties, classes, and nations, etc., which offers an opportunity for an elementary exposition of the science and art of politics. Understood as a body of, for, of practical rules for research, and a detailed observations useful for awakening an interest in effective reality, and for stimulating more rigorous and more vigorous Political insights. This research project needs to be accompanied by strategy and tactics, by strategic plan, by propaganda, agitation, command structure, science, political organization, etc. Knowledge of reality thus required combination with politics in order to transform a particular relation of forces, take the initiative and find the weak spots of one's adversaries. Yet the balance of forces is never stable but is constantly shifting, which means political action involves seizing historical conjunctures and their contradictory tendencies, tendencies that rule out any cat catastrophism, any policy of the worse, the better. Therefore, in studying historical moment, it is, was important to distinguish between organic moments, which are relatively permanent, from movements which may be termed conjunctural, which appear occasional, immediate, accidental. 
In order to be better illustrate the difference between organic and conjunctural movements, uh, there's an analysis Trotsky gives of the October Revolution in 1932, where he lists the eight historical prerequisites which were necessary for the triumph of the Russian Revolution. And the first five he describes as organic. So the first one is the rotting away of the old ruling classes. The second is the political weakness of the bourgeoisie. Third is the uh, revolutionary character of the agrarian question. Four is the revolutionary character of the, uh, the problem of oppressed nationalities. And five is the significant social burdens on the proletariat. Now these five organic phenomena, phenomena were relatively permanent features of the Tsarist Empire and gave rise to certain conjunctural factors which were far more transitory and those whose maturations ultimately depended on their organic. In the Russian Revolution, the following three are conjunctural phenomena, which would be the Revolution of 1905, which would be the dress rehearsal for 1917, uh, World War I, and the last one would be the Bolshevik Party. Leaving aside the Bolshevik Party for a moment, the causes of the Russian Revolution, like other crises, came about due to complex interaction between various organic and conjunctural factors, where the outcome could be, not be predicted in advance. Gramsci summed up the interaction between organic and conjunctural processes as follows, and it was a rather long quote, but incredibly important. A crisis occurs sometimes lasting for decades. This <coughs> exceptional duration means that incurable structural <coughs> contradictions have revealed themselves or reached maturity. And despite and that, despite this, the political forces which are struggling to conserve and defend the existing structure itself are making every effort to cure them within certain limits and to overcome them. These incessant and persistent efforts, since no social for formation will ever admit that it's been superseded, from the terrain of the conjunctural and it is upon this terrain that the forces of the opposition organize. These forces seek to demonstrate that the necessary and sufficient conditions are exist to make possible and hence imperative the accomplishment of certain historical tasks. Imperative because any falling short before uh, a duty increases the necessary disorder and prepares more serious catastrophes. The demonstration of the last analysis only succeeds and is true if it becomes a new reality. If the forces of opposition triumph in the immediate it is developed in a series of ideological, religious, philosophical, political polemics whose concreteness can be estimated by the extent to which they are convincing and shift the previously existing disposition of social forces. The conjuncture is then defined as the present move moment, which is made of the combination of social contradiction and the balance of class forces. The conjuncture defines the strength of classes, their consciousness and forms of struggle, and different relations of each state, other, and the state. From an analysis of a conjunct uh, conjunctures contradictions, the class struggle governs the various means of communist intervention. The conjuncture is the embodiment of the unity of theory of practice. On the one hand, understanding reality. On the other, developing the appropriate means of intervention. The U.S. Marxist Paul Costello identifies three types of conjunctures. First is the socially stable conjuncture. It's characterized by latent rather than explosive contradictions and the relatively smooth process of capitalist development. Two, the crisis conjunctures uh, characterized by capitalism's fundamental need for restructuring of one kind or another, but the possibility uh, for state power passing out of the hands of capitalists is not yet present. And third is the revolutionary or transitional conjuncture characterized by the possibility of state power passing from the hands of the ruling class. Now, communist intervention in the first means that efforts to spread socialist ideas, undermine bourgeois ideology, intervene in storm struggles will probably be limited and, pro and may not achieve a mass influence. In regards to the second type of conjunctures, which may be caused by either political or economic events, they lead to a new wave of struggles and disruptions in society. A more severe depression may lead to even wider social and political crisis. In order to maintain the power of the state and the ruling class, may engage in austerity to restore profitability, and they may make compromises of one sort or another. The orientation of a communist party is essential to determine if this conjuncture is potentially revolutionary and or to fight for restructuring the interests of the working class to prepare for further advance. A revolutionary conjuncture will possess elements of the second, but a much more extreme level where there's the real possibility for state power to pass from one class to another. And again, another long quote coming up, but Lenin defined the characteristics of a revolutionary conjuncture and the task for communists in it as follows. And the fundamental law of a revolution, Lenin says, which has been confirmed by all revolutions, 
He says, follows, for a revolution to take place, it is not enough for the exploited and oppressed masses to realize the impossibility of living in the old way and to demand changes. For revolution to take place, it is essential that the exploiter should not be able to live and rule in the old way. It is only when the lower classes do not want to live in the old way and the upper classes cannot carry on in the old way that, that the revolution can triumph. This truth can be expressed. In other words, revolution is impossible without a nationwide crisis. It follows that for a revolution to take place, it is essential first that a majority of workers, or at least the majority of class conscious workers, should fully realize that revolution is necessary and that they should be prepared to die for it. Second, that the ruling class should be going through a governmental crisis, which draws even more backward masses into politics and weakens the government and prepares, it makes it possible for the revolutionaries to rapidly overthrow it, end quote. In analyzing a particular moment, Gramsci warned of the common errors in studying a historical situation was the inability to find the correct relation between what is organic and conjunctural. These er errors can manifest themselves in two ways. The first is economism, which is when there's an overestimation of mechanical causes, and the second is, he is characterized by voluntarism. The economistic devi uh, deviation argue, uh, argues that crises are directly determined by economic factors. Gramsci, to the contrary, states that economic crises merely create a terrain more favorable to the dissemination of certain modes of thought and certain ways of posing and resolving questions involving the subsequent development of national life. Well, it's true that conjunctures such as those that say the stock market crash of 29 or the 2007 recession create a more favorable climate for radical ideas, but the onset of a crisis does not itself guarantee any form of radical victory. As Gramsci argued, while crises are dangerous in the short run, the ruling class and state is able to endure since they possess train cadres, changes men and program, and with greater speed than is achieved by the subordinate classes. And they re reabsorb the control that was slipping from their gra grasp. Therefore, the outcome of a conjunctural crisis is not determined in advance by the unfolding of the inevitable economic breakdown by the interaction between various active classes and social forces who come into combination and conflict until only one of them, or at least a single combination of them, tends to prevail. The second error of ideologicalism or puts the stress on the individual element and voluntarism, Gramsci argued that this type of analysis poses that one's baser and more immediate desires and passion are the cause of error, and that they take the place of an objective and impartial analysis, and this happens not as conscious means to stimulate to action, but as self-deception. In this case, too, the snake bites the snake charmer. In other words, the demagogue is the first victim of his own demagoguery. So, in the case of Blunky, various, who had various conspiracies, which were not based on any detailed examination of the objective factors, but solely on perfecting his conspiratorial organization. His whole approach was limited by elitism, divorce from the masses. He possessed a theory to analyze social contradictions, identify allies, plan strategy, or decide the right moment. Rather, Blanqui believed once the conspiratorial organization was perfected, the revolution would succeed. It did not. Uh, now, we could say the same about Che Guevara's approach to guerrilla warfare. We argue that popular forces can wage, win a war against the army. It is not necessary to wait for all the conditions for making, to wait until all conditions for revolution exist. The insurrection can create them. Che believed that objective possibilities for revolution already existed throughout Latin America, but only the subjective possibility of revolution was missing. The subjective factor could be created by the armed struggle itself via a small group or foco who would spark the revolution. Che's method of warfare neglected the questions on the role of the party, mass organizations, careful determining whether the cities or countryside was the best terrain, and analysis of the different classes and political forces in Latin America. The generation of Latin American revolutionaries who took inspiration from Che launched focos that were largely defeated. The failure of Che's strategy was most dramatically demonstrated by his own death in Bolivia. The guerrilla movements of the following decades in Nicaragua, El Salvador, Peru, or elsewhere, abandoned folkism and developed far more sophisticated political and military approaches to warfare, such as protracted warfare and guerrilla-inspired popular insurrection. As opposed to falling into these two errors, Gramsci argued for the active role of politics. Gramsci contended that a communist party, or the modern prince, would fulfill a similar function to Machiavelli's prince by acting as a proclaimer and organizer of an intellectual and moral reform, which also means creating the terrain for a subsequent development of the national popular collective will towards the realization of a superior total form of, of civilization. The modern prince was not a single person, but can only be an organism 
essentially a political party. Such a party, if it's to fulfill its historical function, would need to be composed of three elements. Average men, whose participation is through organization and discipline, but they are forced only when there's somebody to centralize, organize, and discipline them. The second element are captains or party leadership who not only centralize and discipline the masses, but also possess the power of innovation. And the third group, which articulates the first element with the second and maintains contact with them, not only physically, but also morally and intellectually. And the third group were the organic intellectuals who would serve as leaders of the proletariat in the party. The organic intellectuals not only work to narrow the gap between leaders and led, but they popularize revolutionary ideas among the masses and raise their intellectual level, combat common sense, etc. And Gramsci looked to Lenin's Bolshevik party as the a successful example of a modern prince. However, he also looked back in history to the Jacobins, arguing that they were the only party of the revolution in progress, in the, as much as they not only represented the immediate needs and aspirations of the actual uh, individuals who constituted the French bourgeoisie, but they also represented the revolutionary movement as a whole, as an integral historical development. The Jacobins were not merely the party of the revolutionary bourgeoisie, but united under their banner, the sans coliots the peasantry, into a multi-class bloc. Furthermore, the Jacobins were the champions of the first French Republic and modern civilization against moderates, counter-revolutionaries, and foreign invasion. The modern prince needed to act similarly in a Jacobin manner. The modern prince was not a part of party of professional groups like skilled workers or a simple class party like a labor party. Since only, this only posed the question of winning equality with ruling groups within the existing order. Rather, the modern prince needed to represent not more than sections of workers or even the whole working class but had to represent and leave all the oppressed and exploited under capitalism, underline that. By doing so, the modern prince provides political, cultural, and intellectual and ideological hegemony to contend for leadership in society. Developing his concept of hegemony, Gramsci draws on Machiavelli's image of the centaur for the dual tasks of the revolutionary party, which are the levels of force and consent, authority and hegemony, violence and civilization. For Gramsci, as for Machiavelli, and other practitioners of politics, if one seeks to rule, it is necessary to build and cement alliances beyond an immediate group. This will entail compromises and sacrifices to maintain an alliance. However, these compromises must not touch what is essential, the essential political interests of the leading class. For instance, the Bolsheviks created a worker-peasant alliance by granting the peasantry their land, which actually went against the Bolshevik program, but held on to political hegemony of the revolution. Therefore, the working class cannot limit revolutionary struggle to just their own particular interests, but they had to win the trust and allegiance of other subordinate classes. For Gramsci, it was vital for the proletariat to become the leading force in a revolutionary alliance of the oppressed, something that has been proven time and again by experience of revolutions in Russia, China, Cuba, Vietnam, Nicaragua, Yugoslavia, etc., etc. If the modern prince wants to gain hegemony among the oppressed and exploited, found a new state, this required learning the art of strategy, war, and putting politics in command. Marxist politics understands not just the role of the class struggle and the inner laws and motion of capital, but would develop the means, organizations, and strategies necessary to challenge and topple the rule of capitalism. While revolutions have their roots in so societal contradictions, they often appear as unexpected and unpleasant events to even the most dedicated revolutionaries. A revolutionary party needs to prepare itself to take advantage of them. And as Trotsky observed in a quote Trotsky's ignore, history does not work in such a way that first the foundation is laid, then the productive forces grow, the necessary relations between classes develop, the proletariat becomes revolutionary, then all of this is kept in an icebox and preserved, while the training of a communist party proceeds so that it can get itself ready, while conditions wait and wait. And then it's ready, it can roll up its sleeves and start fighting. No, history does not work that way. Real life political situations are always more complex than those of theory and are thus out of order. However, our approach is not to just wait for things to line up the way they are supposed to. This implies passivity and defeatism. Rather, as Lenin says, revolutionary propaganda can and should be conducted even in a situation that is not revolutionary. We can strengthen our forces step by step, as Mao would say, by hastening and awaiting, an approach which is rooted in the strategic orientation of attracting and training the most advanced in society by rallying them to our banner while awaiting the emergence of a favorable opening and to seize the initiative once it arrives. Now, in conclusion, in, in, our in our time, a Marxist approach to the premacy of politics means creating a modern prince or a political core of communists inspired by the, a bold idea to establish a new society. The modern prince needs to identify 
and the mechanisms of power and exploitation in society will carefully distinguish from the organic from the conjunctural. Based on this knowledge, the advanced class need, forces need to do more than clarify their own ideas. They need to conduct all around outreach among the masses, linking immediate struggles to a universal goal, and build the necessary hegemonic alliances. Lastly, the organic, up more modern prince must take advantage of a revolutionary situation that can appear unexpectedly and lead the conquest of power and institute a new order. Now, before we take questions, comments, concerns, polemics, etc., etc., which I'm sure you have plenty, uh, believe it or not, I don't get paid to do this, and neither does Sunday get put on to put talks on the privacy of politics. So, if you want to give a few bucks, if you want to sign up for the email list, I'm just going to pass this around. But I said a lot, so let's have other people hopefully say a lot. Go ahead. Yeah, uh, a couple of thoughts came up when you were talking about the address of Machiavelli or, or who he's writing to, <laughs> and it, it goes with um, it goes with something Gramsci says about essentially he's uh, proposing a, a Jacobin pro project, a, a, a state building unification project, which is uh, directed at destroying the old regime. And, and what he's offering is a sort of um, a practice, how one would do this. Now, one, I always thought that was a great way of thinking about what Machiavelli is doing. He's offering you a practice rather than uh, the traditional literature. I think you alluded to a mirror of princes or advice to princes. There's a huge, huge bibliography of that kind of stuff going back to the Persians and maybe even before that. I know there's there's actual copies of some of the Persian wisdom literature that it's like advice to princes, but in any case, uh, what Machiavelli does that's different and Lenin and others is they tell you sort of what power is as a practice. And that is sort of talking out of school. And that's something that was kind of alluded to. Who exactly is being addressed? So it's a big controversy in Machiavelli yeah. uh, scholarship. Some people say, well, he's he's really just trying to get a patron, uh, whether it be uh, one of the Medici or somebody else. Um, some say, uh, and, and Marxists uh, mostly say, uh, he's sort of writing beyond. It's funny, uh, Leo Strauss, the horrible uh, reactionary, it kind of comes to a similar thing. He says that uh, Machiavelli is bad because he tells sort of the plebs what power it really is, but we can't have that out. And um, I, I, it's funny how that stuff all sort of corresponds. Mm. But um, but he maybe talk to the, the Jacobin thing. Yeah, I think it was Rousseau who like, yeah. described Prince as a manual for Republicans. So yeah. Rousseau got that already. Yeah. And probably uh, Gramsci and not to say probably got that reading of Machiavelli from Rousseau, I would think. Yeah, I mean I was gonna say like that the oh, whole fair. Like, talk so with for Strauss where that's Rousseau. yeah, where it's a bad thing that for the people to know that. You know, right. Rousseau is like, you know, Machiavelli's a secret Republican. I believe Peter and I have even talked about this a yeah. few times. I mean, in terms of the Jacobin project, I mean, I think it's uh, it's kind of a. F I mean, when I came around the left, like in the late '90s, you know, a lot of you know a lot of Marxist ideas were kind of like submerged. It was more like this: change the world without taking power. Yeah. That kind of rubbish. Yeah. I mean, because that's what it is. It's rubbish. That's right. not how reality works. And you can see it. Like, you're talking about like advice to princes. Like, there's a good portion of Marxist writing on power. You know that I. I say Marxist like that, which is, it's like this very idealistic, like how it should be, not how it function, you know, it's like, and I could say the same about anarchism, like I've, I've often discussed with anarchists, uh, it's like, you know, how about the Spain, it's like, well, we would have, things would have worked out for us, you know, Franco was, and they're like, sure, you know, it's like, well, what, of course it would have worked out for you, it would have worked out for a lot of people if Franco was and I don't want to necessarily pick on anarchists, because they're not the only trend no, that, no, that does, does, everyone does this. You know, there are Trotskyists and left communists who do this as well. And it's like th this type of Jacobin project is something, 
it's sorely missing, I think. I mean, I don't think we understand, I mean, we're here 200 plus years out from the French Revolution, and, you know, whatever else we can say about it, it literally, I mean, at least when I was in history programs, that was when we divided the modern from the pre-modern. You know, it's like, oh, you only care about what happens after July 14th. Right. I mean, because this is like a new political project that they do. And then it's, of course, it's adapted in different ways by Mao and Lenin, etc. but that's what actually succeeded. And I think that there, among many leftists, I mean, that there is a tendency that you, we just want to protest, you know, express our moral indignation, but we can't touch power and everything because that will corrupt us and everything. And I, and this is a little polemical on my side, but I find that with a lot of fears of, say, state capitalism. I find, I, person, it's like, you know, they're going to call you bad no matter what you do, you know, and there's a real necessity to understand how power functions. And that type of Jacobin project, it's, you know, we see, you can probably name, we can all name the left groups that have this sole function on white male industrial workers and heavy industry. Mm -hmm. You know, that's not how politics functions. That type of Jacobin project is not what Lenin or Mao or the great practitioners of politics were about. And I think, like, you know, we were talking about uh, Philip Foner before, before the talk. And Phil, that's what he's focused on in his labor history. It's on white males in these very craft, elite, conservative unions. But it's like, what were the revolutionary unions that existed in the U.S.? Like, the, whatever the limitations, of course, in their time, like the Knights of Labor, the CIO and the IWW, who were really trying in their own ways to like really bring together a much broader swath of workers. And uh, that type of Jacobin project I mean, look at how the old left reacted to the new left. I, I know that we can make fun of parts of the new left all we want, but in the 60s and 70s, who was on the, who was on the other side of the barricades in France, for instance? Whereas you had Maoists who were like in France organizing immigrants, prisoners, gay rights, not so much in the US, but they were doing it in France. And, but again, and, you, know, you had some Trotskyists who were developing new ideas as well. And it's very interesting to look at like those breaks that occur, you know, because things do divide, you know. Obviously, people in old left, some people in old left organizations would say, you know, they're actually the revolutionaries. Let's go over to them. But th that's kind of interesting to look at how that works. That type of Jacobin project. And when I see like, uh, pe you know, you sometimes see people trying to foster it out of thin air now, like groups that would say uh, hitch their stars to rather reformist or populist things, trying to give it a left cast. I, I mean, I think, despite what their political tradition they may come out of, it's not how it works. There's some observations, but let's open it up for other people. Yes, in the back. Um, so you mentioned the discourses a little, and I'm mm -hmm. getting at what uh, the previous question was getting at in terms of um, intended readership. My understanding, I'm not, you know, I've read a little bit of the secondary literature on Machiavelli, I'm not an extra on it by any means. My understanding is that the discourses were meant to be a, uh, maybe a somewhat broader readership, right? It wasn't directly yeah. pitched at, a, at one of the princes as the prince initially was, and that's where the job application concept comes from. Um, as I'm sure many, many people here knew. Um, but the discourses, I mean, were, were, and they were more directly Republican. Right? Yeah, they were more directly about Republican governance, right? So the traditional division is that the prince is about monarchies, essentially, or small principalities, right? One by one guy. The discourses are about republics. Um, is there anything sort of within the discourses that you think, um, that you think are particularly applicable the dynamics that you're talking about here, or are, or is it different enough that you think sort of the, the framework developed in the prince is more, because it would strike me that the discourses being about republics might be, uh, if you had to oppose the two, which you don't have to, but would be, might be also germane. Mm. But first, you can... I, I mean, I know there's also, there's a reading of it, and, and actually, um, I, I think uh, Alcacer certainly read it this way, that there's a way in which you sort of read them together. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And, and I mean, if, if you're talking about creating a state, and, and for Machiavelli, for a state to last, 
um, in conditions of Italy dominated by barbarians as it was, it has to grow. Yeah. And growth necessarily meant following, uh, on the one hand, um, you know, some of the some of the measures of the prince, um, because it would probably take a, a military leader, and following sort of the political advice, uh, the discourse. Yeah, for for the larger. Yeah, for the larger for the larger project because there's more I mean the discourse is a longer work there, yeah. there's a lot more sort of cases to consider right. because yeah. Roman history goes on for a long time sure. I I mean I, I had a lot of I had a seminar and one of my favorite seminars in graduate school was on Machiavelli that I, I think is the reading that makes the most sense to yeah. me I never bought the thing of like he's just trying to get a patron because I mean, for one thing, it didn't work, and, yeah. and you would, if you're going to work that hard for something, you, <laughs> you'd yeah. want a little stronger guarantee. And, and also, that wasn't usually how you got a patron. Usually, you got a patron by showing that you were a pliable tool, right? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> Whatever authority you were seeking, and yeah. he was already in trouble at that point. He was, he was ready to pliable. Yeah, <laughs> like, he had been tortured. tortured. Yeah. Right. Um, so he he wasn't. Uh, that, that wasn't something that was very likely. So I, I think you kind of read them together, and together they do give you one, one more thing that's interesting. Um, I think that there is, this is right before the like explosion of contract theory uh, with Locke and all them. You have uh, Bowdoin, who, when you ask where does political power comes from in, in the French kingdom, it comes from the king. That, that's a very sort of practical answer to that question. He doesn't give an answer like uh, it comes from divine right or something like that. He says it, it, political power because the king literally made, he crafted uh, the kingdom of France out of fuel uh, holdings. Very, very tons and a shit yeah. ton of small ones anyway. Uh, and, and, and there's a way in which uh, even though Hobbes, when people think of the Leviathan, they think of something, something pointing towards, uh, pointing towards contract theory. There, again, there's a way in which uh, I've always thought those early modern theorists are, are much less mystified about political power than yeah. someone like Rawls or <laughs> Habermas, who, you know, they can't think of political power apart from. Uh, Something that basically is is very benign. They don't want to think about it. You know, Rawls is the most sort of you know benign version yeah, one could conceive of, and um, and those people, that's just not a question. Right. You know, um, so I think it's interesting. There's they're all sort of in different points looking at the old regime, the decay of the old regime, uh, but there's not really. Anything that's going to exactly replace it, absolutism isn't really a, a factor yet. And what they're pointing towards is, is something that looks like a weird hybrid, you know, which is what you expect from somebody who doesn't know exactly what they're looking at. Yeah, I mean, you'll you'll recognize this from presumably the, in the seminar that you read, uh, Pocock. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah. So my my reading of it was always that the discourse is. It was the attempt to kind of um, get past the the randomness that time introduces to things. Right. right before history, but before you started getting kind of this upward trend in terms of economic power and political stability that comes with modernity to a certain extent, it really did look like everything that man casts up eventually gets cast back down in a, in a pretty rapid cycle. That you know, and so people, um, you know, that, that you could be as good as you want. Right, either good morally or good uh, as a, in terms of having your shit together, in terms of having a really well run state, but eventually you had to be good all the time. Fortune would eventually get you. Right? Bad luck, the wheel of fortune would inevitably cast you down. And Machiavelli, to the extent they had a, you know, a solution to it, solution might be a strong term, but the discourse is the idea was, okay, you can create a republic and that republic can last if you imbue the people with sufficient virtue. So it's not just the prince. 
again. So it's not just a prince, it's a people uh, more broadly, and that, that way they can, uh, A, they're, they'd be more capable of protecting themselves when uh, you know, their rivals attack them, or when they have to attack their rivals, and B, uh, you know, they would be able to, uh, you know, have, have uh, they, would, they wouldn't give fortune a chance to cast them down. Um, so that would strike me as, in that case, you, you uh, sort of an encouragement towards, uh, you know, if you want to translate into a communist idiom, right, about the, the nurturing of, and bolstering of the mass movement, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. Uh, first of all, I want to thank them for waiting till 4 o'clock to <laughs> start the, the drum for once. Yeah. Uh, but secondly, um, in terms of the read, my, at least how I was wrote this, my reading of both the prints and the discourses too explicitly on Althusser. That was like yeah. something I did intentionally. Uh, so his Machiavellian Us, which is a wonderful work, uh, which I recommend that everyone actually check out. I mean, so I can't actually, I think uh, I'm not going to offer an uh, the definitive answer of who Machiavelli was speaking to. I would tend to probably lean on the Gramsci Rousseau side of it, and ironically the Strauss side. Uh, but in terms of what you were just getting at at the end, um, I mean, Machiavelli has, you know, as you say, like dealing with like uh, imbuing virtue among, you know, people to cre keep the republic. I mean, it's been the continual effort, like among the various revolutions of the last century, of how to do that. So you had, and you know, because some of those states no longer exist, so it was a real issue. I mean, that's arguably what was partly behind the Cultural Revolution, which you know we had the event here uh, last month. And you know, it's obviously was a, in many respects, a critique of you know the Soviet experience and others. And if anarchists had come to power, they would have faced this, assuming they wanted, you know, whatever. But they would have faced the same issue. And it was you know came up with the French Revolution, like how do we imbue that virtu among the people? I mean, it's a real question, and we may not be able to definitively decide it, but it has, of course, dogged a lot of revolutions across the century. I brought up Che, you know, Che had to deal with like, how do we encourage that communist morality among the people? Yeah, I mean, yeah, Marty. yeah, right. Yeah, I mean, it seems insofar as there is an answer, it's a, it's a building of institutions before the revolution. Mm -hmm. but it's a building of, uh, you know, even just, you know, things like, you know, trade unions and even, right. you know, say what you want about the German Social Democrats, but they had, you know, right. a, a massive, uh, which, you know, whatever their politicians wound up doing, at least created the sense of solidarity among a certain sector of the people and an idea of, and the, this active participation stuff, like, you know, as silly as it sounds, like elite clubs, sure. and, you know, uh, and insurance companies, and this, that, and the other thing. So it strikes me as though, but that might lead into the kind of attitude they eventually had, where you build these institutions, and you don't want them to wind up being destroyed in a civil war, right? right? You, you, you wind up administering these things that the labor parties eventually wind up doing, that then you wind up with the attitude of an administrator as opposed to a, anything else. If you, yeah, go to go with what you said, it, it's interesting because people read the discourses and prints, obviously. They don't read the work on war as much. And that, that goes directly to what you're saying because that is the problem he's concerned about yeah. more than anything else in on war is how to create um, conditions of military success. And for him, the ultimate sort of determiner is the, the human aspect of it, the subjective aspect. And so all of his theorizing about military practice um, is based around that. And again, that kind of goes with the Jacobin thing, the notion of a nation in arms, right. which can't right. be defeated because you know everybody else is fighting for the prince, they're right. fighting for pay. Machiavelli's famous critique of uh, mercenaries. Mercenaries, yeah, yeah, fighting for pay or fighting for something. And which is what all the Italian princes used at that time. Yeah. And, um, Everybody, not just yeah. the Italian. That was yeah. mercenary warfare. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, all, all the yeah. Up. I mean, if we look at like you know these building of new institutions and again getting back to socialism, uh, you know when the Soviet Red Army went, went into Eastern Europe, Albania and Yugoslavia aside, you know they had to ascend, like this was not or uh, this was imposed upon those countries. Now I'm not saying the Soviets should have just let these Polish landlords etc. come back. 
but it was a real problem they face, you know, because a lot of these populations were very anti-communist. So how do you develop those institutions? Whereas, you know, when, say, the Vietnamese or the Chinese communists came to power, it had been through popular war, you know, that they had essentially built that hegemony beforehand, and that legitimacy, you know, have carried over to a significant, you know, after they came to power as well, whereas in countries like Poland, Hungary, or Romania, you had to, and arguably they did not do it well yeah. in you know trying to foster some new institutions. But did they do that, or did they just cat, like paint red old institutions? And you know, I have my own feelings about that. But it's you know, how, how do you do that? And it's like, and it was interesting when you brought up you know Machiavelli's book on war. It's like I remember re I reread Clausewitz book on war a few years ago, and it's like one of the innovations he brings up of modern warfare is the nation in arms. You know, and that was like a huge thing, like the levy and mass of the French Revolution, that was completely new. It was like, it's like, before that it was like these, like a specialized, trained armies, it was not mass conscription. I don't think we realize that's a very modern thing. You know, it's like, when you do that, it's like, people get worried. You know, these rulers get worried if you suddenly have millions of ordinary people in a uniform with guns, because they can get around. Yeah. It's funny how things are kind of going back to the professional, mm, right. you know, where it's incredibly expensive. It always has been, I mean, from going back to the olden times, field of professional army. And yet, all over the world, the, the, the pendulum has swung back the other way, so even the European countries now are dropping uh, their universal conscription all going to professional. Even Israel has been discussing getting rid of the Yeah, mm. yeah. And, and, and yet, they're, they're not particularly military efficient. I mean, there's there's drafting armies on the whole have a, have a militarily better record, and they're incredibly expensive because you have to have people at such a level that they're willing to sacrifice a lot of their life living a shitty military, you know, a bad military existence for 25 or 30 years. In a lot of cases, what I think in a lot of cases, one of the reasons why it makes a comparative amount of sense is because they're not being tasked with these armies to be defending exactly. their country. That's why. They're being tasked with what amounts to death squad work or the support well, of police squad work squad overseas. Country. In the case of the U.S., I mean, well, yeah. the well, uh, it was in this US is, this is a, That's it. Right this is there. a wonderful Maybe. book. Yeah. These this is one that's of the it, best right books there, on, that's why. <laughs> a wonderful book on, it's one of the few we have, GI Resistance in Vietnam. I mean, of course the anti-war movement, the black liberation movement, but just read about what happened in the U.S. Yeah. Army in Vietnam. Really? And remember, I, I did an interview with Aaron Leonard about it over, um, close to a year ago, <coughs> the, who wrote a book on like uh, U.S. Maoists. And re the largest U.S. anti-war movement was essentially allied to the preeminent Maoist party in the U.S. So that that happened, yeah. and that's yeah. you know partly why it's a more professional army. It doesn't mean that you know there's there's still you know cracks and resistance, but it's not like obviously not like it was yeah. here. No, it, it's funny you talk about the Israeli military. I, I know a guy who was uh, he was an officer in Lebanon, and before they pulled out, he said they began to have a, a, a serious issue with self mutilators. Yeah. People were uh, people were shooting themselves or stabbing. Like in Vietnam, this was end of World War One. was epidemic. Um, he said one night they were out on patrol. They hear uh, somebody fire off like three shots, like you do when you're you have the auto on, and uh, shot off three shots. And they ran up to the guy, and he he was trying to self mutilate. Only he had his weapon on auto, so he about took his leg off. He thought he was just gonna fire a shot into it and, you know, destroy one of his legs. But this was a real issue, um, which that may be one reason why they wanted to look seriously at a professional military, because also they're, they're not doing it very well. Man. You know, they didn't do well in 2006. So. <laughs> yeah, and I think too, like, uh, like because, you know, Vietnam, like the U.S. actually left, they didn't, yeah. you know, keep carpet bombing them after. No, no. They were forced to stop altogether. They lost. They lost. They lost. Let's be clear. They <laughs> lost. So, you, know, you know, we may have gotten booted out of Iraq to a certain extent, but not to that same degree because the professional army is, you know, they're fine with continuing that. 
Yeah, although even there, I think one of the things that you were running into was people, the military isn't very big relative to how it used to be. And the four and five deployments were destroying uh, readiness. I mean, lots of military commanders wrote about that they, they were having a problem with, uh, with readiness because of the constant deployments, people's morale is dropping. And, um, and that's, military discipline is like one of the hardest things it is to maintain. Once it breaks, that's it. Those, those military units usually have to be reformed. Here's my answer in Vietnam and, yeah. and, and it's after like people like World War I. It's how like people like Colin Powell would have Portugal 1974. Exactly. Was, exactly. was Portugal 1974. Exactly. Portugal 1974. Exactly. Yeah. There's another one. Yeah. yeah. It took a decade. They had to create a whole new institutional like so um, the CIA ethos. Had the war in El Salvador. Yeah. Basically, the U.S. could not do. Yeah. Overseas invasions for yeah. at least a couple decades. Yeah, until until the first Iraq war, and then that kind of convinced them that they were back in action. I mean, I'm not normally one to recommend anything by Noam Chomsky, but he has like a lot of interesting stuff on like how you know after the U.S. defeat in Vietnam, you know they had to like reconstruct the narrative and stuff, mm -hmm. and it's very interesting to look at how that's done. You know how because you know states don't want you to remember this. This is like something you act like they actively suppress or they distort, and uh, that's you know it'd be it, it's interesting to wonder how like the French state is going to commemorate uh, World War One, especially the anniversary of the mutinies that occurred in like 1917-18, because states don't want you to remember that except as like you know traitors or whatnot, whereas for us they should be you know inspirational examples. Well, they, the easiest you know if you're in the military. You got these people who you've never met over there, and they're shooting at you, maybe. But you've got people over here that are yelling at you, that have, you know, had a hand in making your life miserable. And all it takes is for it to come into your head that, like, you know what? I've had enough of this. This war is for the birds, and I hate that guy. And you know, who's been riding me for four years. And so the next time he walks in front of me, you know, I'm gonna smoke him. And that's once that thought goes around, it's very tough to put back in the put back in the box, you know. Once once the regular troopies realize that when they get orders, they say, you know, it happened all the time in Vietnam. After a while, the officers stop giving controversial orders. They're afraid, you know, go up over that hill and tell me what's over there, and the troops go, no, I don't think so. You know, once that happens, it's it's like it's like an epidemic. I mean, look at like the Portuguese. Like I'm going to get Portugal and Germany in World War. Uh, in, when Portugal is fighting all these colonial wars in Africa, mm -hmm. the armies that they're specifically fighting are led by various forms of Marxists and socialist ideology. Yeah. So partly to know your enemy, a lot of these officers and soldiers are reading about them. It's like you know that's kind of a good idea, mm -hmm. and they're kind of looking. You know, it's like this authoritarian, quasi-fascist state back home, and eventually like. Some of them, they overthrow it. Yeah. They have a coup, they overthrow it, and those colonies are independent. And a lot of Marxist groups in Portugal had a lot of these soldiers who were part of it. And then, interestingly, after World War I, Germany, you know, the German army breaks. And it's interesting, like, there are, aren't, like, a lot of them, those soldiers become communists. Like, remember, the German Communist Party has an armed wing. It's the Red, the Red, Front, or the Red Front Fighters, or whatever it's called. Yeah, these are World War I veterans. These are not just like people parading. Like they, they know how to fight and to shoot. And the German state, the Weimar Republic, had this serious problem with these armed power militaries. Who, you know, they were obviously going to favor the right every time, but they had the Fry Corps, the stormtroopers, who also knew how to fight. So the state was never quite able to ma re maintain that uh, monopoly on violence. So. In the one sense, yeah, you have those soldiers who like, you know, you'll, will frag the officer or something, but you have other people who come through these wars just loving it. Oh, you yeah, know, they, yeah. they hate, the, like, just read Ernst Jolner's uh, Storm of Steel, which is a frighteningly awesome book, you know, by a frightening reactionary author. But people like wars like this reinvigorate the spirit, you know, we can read, it's like this, like communism of the trenches is really weird, but, yeah, yeah. but you know, that, that exists, you know. Just like, you know, there are these like, 
what, like, you know, we all know them, these wonderful anti-imperialist veterans, etc. They're also like these die-hard reactionaries who are like, we need to kill enough of them Arabs or something yeah. like that. Yeah. yeah, what's his name? The, the dead guy. Chris Kyle? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> discussion than last month. Nothing against anyone from last month, but we have time. Things. Yeah, I think just what you mentioned at the beginning, like the other side to that cynicism too is like a real fear of taking power. Sure. People, you know, I, I think what's really endemic among a lot of left groups is that they only think about power in the abstract, but not in the concrete sense, and they're very afraid of the idea of having to take power and having to do what's necessary to maintain it. Yeah, I mean, some of, I think most of you know here, like I moderate a few Facebook groups and I, I was in an argument with someone on one of them and he was this anarcho-liberal or something. He was going on about red terror, Bolsheviks, Kronstadt, and all this, this stuff. But then he's going on about, you know, supporting the senators and the Democrats, and I'm just like, I'm like, wait, wait, wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. Okay, first of all, you, you lose the title of anarchist when you're doing that. That aside, it's like, why do you have a problem with red terror? All the anti-communists aside, why do you actually have a problem with that? I mean, you, you're apologizing for an actual imperialist party, imperialist candidates, but you have no pro but you have a problem with the proletariat doing it. So, I and mean, it goes back to that Kakaia quote I use. You know, it's like, you deny it for one, but you uphold it for the other. I mean, and I do think that's a problem. You know, you, you know, again, yeah, it's like, Occupy couldn't conceive of that. And whatever the good things we can say about Occupy, I really couldn't conceive of that. And you see a lot of groups now, it's like, I had a friend of mine sharing me about something that winning Sanders supporters, and I was reading this, like, this is electoral rubbish. And it's like, I, I think he meant well, I don't want to get too bad on him, but it's like, you, it's like, oh, electing council members, it's like, that's power? That's not power. And it's like, who's going to get excited about that after a bit? You know, it's like, you're just going to be a bunch of administrators, you know, with, uh, who wear red flag lapels or something. And it's like, you know, there is a serious inability to confront a lot of this. Like, some groups, you know, they, out there, they, they won't deal with, like, I think realities of like what the Cubans or the Chinese or others do after a certain time because it's like, you know, they don't want to confront that. And it's like part, I mean, I'm not saying one should uphold all of this uncritically, but they had to deal with real issues and real problems. You know, one reason, you know, I spent a lot of time at one point studying the Soviet planning systems, like that was a real issue. You know, no one had ever done that before and they had to do that you know, with all this upheaval and all all this other mess going on. And it's like, it's not going to be perfect. It really isn't. You know, whoever does it, it's going to be messy. And I think a lot of people, you know, they just want this nice, clean, we can just gradually do it, even if, like, they come out of a tradition upholding a figure like Lenin or something. You know, has Lenin just been sanitized into electing, you know, city council members or something? Or is Lenin a serious uh, theorist about power? And uh, I mean, I, I don't really have much respect for that. I understand where it comes from, but it is frustrating. Yeah, I, and I think, you know, trying to figure out how to overcome that is probably one of the biggest tasks today that we need to figure out. Okay. So I, just to go along with what you're saying, I mean, one of the things that I, I've always thought about the electoral thing. Aside from that, it, it takes an incredible amount of energy and resources mm -hmm. to get anywhere in it, which it's hard for me to imagine that the prize is worth the effort. But beyond that, to go along with Machiavelli, Machiavelli doesn't say that the way to make a new state is by hiring mercenary armies or using um, 
the fuel nobility that existed in, in certain parts of Italy, or taking the things that were already the players that were already in the field and using things as they were. What he says is, the field is your problem. The, you know what 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 the prince does. The reason the prince is important, um, and the advice that he's offering in, in the discourses is he's coming from outside of the system. And that's the, that's a point that Althusser makes too. Yes. That, that the prince comes from outside of the system, and I think that that's also the role of, of a revolutionary party. Yeah. The revolutionary party is the going, Well, if we just get the process right, we can figure out how to relate to one another in a decent way or something like that. Uh, they say, you know, we're going to upset the apple cart and take power, and then. You know, figure out where we're at. Right. I mean, remember, Badu says the event comes out of the void, seemingly yeah. out of nowhere. Yeah. And one can argue that there is a linkage between Althusser's late, like stuff. No, I think, I yeah, think and I would argue, you know, I didn't support that. I think much. Uh, whatever else one can say for him is Badu, it's the event, how it emerges, and it's like, yeah. But yeah, it's like when you're looking at, you have, you do have to look at your situation, as Machiavelli says, as it actually exists. But how many people are just trying to rearrange deck chairs on the Titanic? You know, I think quite a few of them. And it's, it's, it's really actually hard to think. Like, uh, how do we actually flip the game board completely? I mean, I think some of the theorists I mentioned have like a lot of use for that. And it's not so much repe rote repeating the quotations they use, however pithy they may be, but learning the method they use, I mean, it's really important. Like, I mean, uh, Lukács, I mean, he kind of bends the stick a bit, but Marxism defined by its method. Obviously, the method gets updated, the method, ch you know, changes, but it's real. like, to actually learn how to think like that, I mean, that's something you, that's w worth doing. Again, not repeating this like it's gospel, but you know, because that's just religion, you know, in the worst sense. We want to like think and act as revolutionaries. And obviously, aside from the, the practice, you know, I was trying to get at, there's also the theoretical, again, the methodology behind it. Do we have any other questions, comments, concerns, objections? Thank you very much. Oh, you're welcome. Again, uh, thanks for coming. Next month, Charles Bettelheim. Uh, and the uh, event page for that will be up, the video for this will be up uh, hopefully by tomorrow, and the written version of this up too soon. So, there we go. Thanks. Thanks all.